is Silicon Valley dying? Is Silicon Valley dead? Now, we have a different perception from the inside, but I'm sensing that the rest of the world still kind of wondering about that. What do you think? I mean, how do you answer them? I, I mean, I, I, you know, we're in the business of, of headlines, right? And, and, you know, we started the show talking about weather, you know, and we in a pretty quick way went from California is going to be in a drought forever to California is going to be underwater forever. And I think somewhere much, much more in between lies the truth of these things. Silicon Valley is struggling um, because we've lost a lot of value. How did that value go much higher? Because during the pandemic, the headlines were the world cannot live without Silicon Valley. Um, now you're seeing headlines, Silicon Valley is dead. Again, I would make the pitch that somewhere deeply in the middle of that is, is the truth. Uh. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Friday, January 13th, Friday the 13th installment of the Silicon Insider, the only uncensored look at life and business in the Valley. My name is Mike Malone, and I'm here with special contributor Scott Budman, technology reporter and apparently weather reporter recently for NBC Bay Area. Our producer, Jordan Henderson, who just had a car accident in the rain, and our East Coast sports correspondent is Bob Grove. And our host, as always, is the Silicon Valley Business Journal. Okay, Scott, we got to talk first about this atmospheric pineapple whatever it's called, Express, that's hit the valley for the last week and a half. Because when they take the nation's top daily television tech reporter off the beat and they put him in a windbreaker on a rainy hillside waiting for the hillside to fall down, to slide into the highway, you know it's got to be bad weather in Silicon Valley. And this is sort of, <laughs> I've lived here my whole life. I don't think, I can't remember many years of the last 60 that were like this. I mean, this is crazy. And it's 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 having an effect on Silicon Valley. Thousands of trees coming down, flooding, roads closed. Tell me about it. Tell me what it's been like. I've seen you in Hayward. I've seen you in San Jose. I saw you in downtown San Francisco, I guess, in what in the mission district? The mission district. Yeah. Okay. You you have been oh, oh, and also the Tesla that went off devil's slide and landed upside down. Now, I can see that as a tech story because they survived what 120 foot drop to the rocks. Yeah. So all these storms have been, uh, have been crazy and um, it's kind of an all hands on deck thing. I mean, I don't want to say that, um, you know, the inflation report or, you know, any other business story, you know, housing prices are less important on a day when everyone's being flooded out, but there is an immediacy to this weather and covering it because people just haven't seen it. Like you said, it's been very surprising to a lot of people. And I don't just mean people that live up by the Russian River, you know, or in the hills above or, you know, Montecito, you know, those places in right. parts of California that are normally getting flooded out with with huge weather events. I mean, people in Willow Glen had no power. People in Palo Alto were getting flooded out. The South Bay were getting flooded out. I mean, this was just crazy obviously San Francisco and the Mission District or along 17th Street, you know, huge flooding. And uh, yeah, it shuts businesses down. It keeps people from going to work. I think the idea that people were already used to working from home kind of helped because they had an yeah. excuse to say, I don't want to come to the office this week. Uh, those of us who did work, um, worked outside and got drenched. And that's, uh, you know, part of uh, part of the game, I guess, for uh, for being a TV reporter. And, you know, I saw my my brothers and sisters in radio and, and newspaper out as well, bearing the elements, uh, trying to do what they can. And, you know, you mentioned Jordan, our producer, a uh, very hard worker. Um, you know, we did check with him a little car damage, but fortunately, he's OK. But a lot of people um, yeah. are checking into the body shop for uh, car accidents there. It's just really treacherous out there. I got a kick out of, you know, you and your fellow reporters were saying, it's dangerous out here, ladies and gentlemen, stay off the roads. And then in consecutive days, you're in the South Bay, you're in San Francisco, you're in the East Bay, <laughs> you know, at the most perilous time to be on the highways, our intrepid, our intrepid reporter is out there covering stories. That's right. We're like the post office, you know, neither uh, rain nor sleet will keep us away. And, but, you know, look, this is California and this is about as crazy as it gets, right? High winds, heavy rains, 
Um, I know people who have worked in much, much tougher weather markets, uh, you know, in say upstate New York or something, and they're standing outside in sub, you know, degree temperatures doing their thing. And it's, it's part of the business. What can I say? Well, it, it, uh, it was welcome. I mean, we all appreciate it because, yeah, you know, I, I live, this is the oldest house in Silicon Valley, and I am surrounded by 100 foot trees. And when those winds came in, I was I was hunkered down and whimpering. And to see you out there, intrepid reporter, microphone in hand, and one of your fellow reporters, a tree fell on the, on the company car while they were out uh, filming, right? Right behind. Yeah, yeah. And they talked about that. Unfortunately, they weren't in the truck at the time and, and it wasn't that badly damaged. But yeah, I mean, this is one of those things where you never know where these trees are going to fall. And that's why when the weather people say, look up before you even leave your house or as you leave your house, um, you just never know with winds this strong. And it's something we're just not used to. And so, you know, we get rain and we think, oh, it's nice and cozy. I mean, I would have been woken up many nights over the past week and a half at like 2 a.m. by just the sheer force of it wind does. and rain on, on the windows and the roof. Yeah, it's been that loud. I'm sure other people watching this and else other parts of the country think, what a bunch of wussies out there in California. <laughs> but it turns out we have the most variable rainfall pattern of any place in the United States. And we just got off five years of a drought where we couldn't even turn on our, our sprinklers. And now the reservoirs are topping over all in a week. Right. As Californians, we always say, hey, we need the rain until it comes this much. And then we're like, whoa, OK. Oh, okay enough enough's enough. Yeah. OK, well, let's get to business stuff. Um, you, As you said, you covered the inflation numbers that just came out. Yeah, What's so inflation your... that you know the the CPI consumer price index essentially the cost of what we spend money on is slightly down in December and that you know reverses a trend of of you know high prices now inflation still high for the year um this is largely because two things fuel costs uh and uh, and gas prices are down and anyone who's filled up a tank in the last few weeks knows it's gotten a lot cheaper uh and yeah. that really cuts in that's part of what we spend our money on Groceries actually ticked a bit higher for December, um, but uh, things like six bucks for a dozen eggs, yeah, right? eggs are a big part of that. I mean, to uh, to see how much it costs for not only you know individuals like us buying eggs at the store, where now the average price in California for a dozen of eggs reached seven dollars, but think about your local diner, your restaurants, they're paying you know double what they did. Uh, just a, a month or two ago, and that's inflation in action. Also, the bird flu, but costs for groceries are still high, even as gas prices drop. Um, but uh, we're still dealing with inflation. And that is why at the end of this month, at the end of January, it's not um, unlikely. I think that we'll see another hike in interest rates. Yeah, they're, they're already predicting that. But they're also saying inflation may be finally peaked. We'll probably, it'll continue most of this year, but it's probably not going to go up anymore. So is that going to spare us from recession? I mean, it's hard to say. Again, you know, recession seems to be defined in different ways by whatever. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of job losses in the tech industry, right? But not across the country. You know, just in the sliver that is the tech industry, we're seeing a lot of job losses. But um, uh, we're, we haven't seen that much overall uh, in the in the you know, in the job world as far as cutbacks. So uh, that's good news. Um, and I think if that stays steady, um, you know, the tech industry will eventually bounce back. The overall economy is looking more at gas prices and groceries and, and that kind of thing. And so do we dip into recession? Again, it depends how you define it. I mean, we haven't talked in a couple of weeks, but I guess the biggest, most, the most recent big layoff, 7,000 people at Salesforce. I don't think we discussed this the last time we talked. That's interesting because Salesforce just seems invulnerable to almost any economic force. They've been they've been a a monster for years and years. You know, building that giant tower in San Francisco to see them cut back was kind of a surprise to me. Right, and that's a big one. They grew a lot. They hired a lot of people. They bought Slack, um, yeah. and so and it, this wasn't just during the pandemic. Uh, you know, where a lot of software companies really, really grew. This has been for, for years now. And so for them to cut 10% is major, but at the same time, 
I think, you know, it's an acknowledgement and even Mark Benioff saying, hey, maybe we just flat out grew too much. He put out those sort of cryptic uh, inner office emails saying, hey, some of the new hires aren't, you know, keeping up, whatever that means. That's got to be scary if you're one of them. Um, but I think some of the sheen is off Salesforce. Certainly the stock price is, is, I believe, been cut like 40 percent over the last year. Um, and it just it was hot. And then it just cooled down like so many other software companies. It just became one of the biggest. Okay, now the market actually went up this week. I think we had five days in a row of uh, the Dow going up. That We haven't seen that in quite a while. Is that a good sign or is it a temporary thing reacting to these inflation numbers? Um, both. You know what? I think it's a good sign because those who invest are looking ahead and saying, Maybe people will be able to buy things again, whether it's software or hardware. Um, you know, there's this constant drumbeat uh, that business reporters like myself hear of the stock market is not the economy. Um, OK, but it's certainly a part of the economy and it right. certainly shows part of what the economy is about, especially out here uh, in the Bay Area. And so to see these tech stocks sort of start to bounce back a little bit, whether it's NASDAQ, Meta, Tesla. NASDAQ finally broke 11,000 again. Yeah, I mean, that's like a milestone in some way, psychologically, if nothing else. Right, right. Um, so I think that's good. And it's good for the overall economy. If people have a little more money when it comes to stock options to spend and, and buy things. Uh, yeah. But overall... And companies have more capital to, to invest on things. Right, right. So, okay, now you sent me a note at which made my jaw drop and actually gave me chills because this, this is the most worrisome piece of news I've heard in a long time, which is that uh, VC numbers down 90% last year from the year before. Now, venture capital investments are the biggest bellwether for the future of them all. And when the VCs are throwing money around, investing in a lot of new startups, yeah, most of those startups will die eventually. But there'll be some very, very big winners. But if you've lost, if you cut back 90% on your investments, there's something very worrisome about that. And it augurs for, you know, a lack of new companies three or four years from now that are, that are taking off. I agree. Um Looking back at 2022, it's not that surprising that VC investment was down. That was the year the stock market went way down. It was the year tech stocks went way down. It was the year we gave back so much of the gains that happened when you know we were in lockdown. And we've talked about that before. But also, I mean, geez, were there even enough IPOs to count on one hand in the year? I mean, it was really, really, you know, the exits were very small unless your company got bought. And if it did, it probably got bought at a, a lower valuation. So I think as we head into 2023 and we see, you know, the uh, open AIs of the world get valued near $30 billion and, you know, we're, we're starting to see some VC action, but it's not surprising that the dollars pulled out by VCs were so much lower because what did we lack? We lacked big buyouts and we lacked IPOs. In other words, the sexy exits that VCs often see. Yeah, but sure. But those funds were already filled that they're sitting on. So, and I know they were seeing a lot of business plans. So why would they cut back on putting money? And I think there's another deeper problem. And I actually had lunch a couple of days ago with one of the, well, actually a Silicon Valley pioneer who's now a major venture capitalist. And he was complaining. He said, yeah, we get a lot of business plans, but every one of them has a short term business horizon. I mean, it's, we'll sell out quickly. You know, uh, none of them talk about going public. They all talk about mergers and acquisitions and it's a quick exit. We got this clever little device or this clever little app. We're going to run it up and sell it within 18 months. And he said, this lack of long-term thinking is kind of playing chaos with investing. You know, do you want the quick return, quick hit, or do you want to build that company that has a lot of internal value? I mean, it's a good question. It's There are two schools of thoughts. Remember the the Uber days, you know, for a while back in like uh, 2019, 2020, companies 
purposely staying away from the public market, saying we can do this by ourselves and raise money. And that's how you got those, you know, DECA unicorns and just huge, huge valuations. Um, you know, you look at now, say, a SpaceX, you know, that has avoided going public all this time and is still raising money. Um, on the other hand, right, you have the quick exit, like, hey, we're an app. We yeah. really don't have a long future here on this earth. We're either going to become part of somebody's, you know, metaverse or gaming platform or whatever, or we're just going to flame out. And that's a different sort of, uh, you know, way of thinking. And yeah, if you're a VC, maybe you're thinking, hey, we want some long-term viability here. But it, there are just so many ways to go about this now. The App Store has changed things. Um, you know, the the SPAC briefly changed things. I don't think we've seen all that many. And I don't know if the SPACs are long for this world. But there are different ways to find an exit now, many yeah. different, even in the last couple of decades. And I think that's, I guess, good in a flexibility way. But on the other hand, right, do you really want to sink, you know, millions or tens of millions of dollars into something that may be short-lived. Yeah, exactly. And he sort of suggests there was a personality shift with the latest <laughs> the latest generation of entrepreneurs. Something's going on that, that their attitude is different about how this works. And it's a much more quick hit and move on to the next thing. Uh, attitude versus 20 years ago or 40 years ago with a very different kind of notion of what constitutes a successful company. Well, so maybe we'll see. Yeah, maybe they're deciding they'd like to put a down payment on a Silicon Valley house and they don't want to wait 10 years to do it. They got to get out now. <laughs> so you won't be interviewing in their tent on the swollen Guadalupe River. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, this week's uh, our weekly Young Frauds edition. <laughs> Uh, we have a guy named uh, uh, Frank, uh, oh, Charlie Javis. Did you read about him? It's actually a her, but yes, yes. Yeah, he basically sold his company to J.P. Morgan uh, for $175 million off after raising $5 million in 2020. Then J.P. Morgan discovered that his little startup called um, uh, Frank, actually only had he, he said it had four million users it actually only had three hundred thousand user users so jp morgan just got themselves in a, a financial investment company just got themselves caught making a really stupid financial investment apparently because they didn't do due diligence does anybody do due, due diligence anymore we uh, saw so a couple, couple things home. Yeah, this was this was a promising startup to help college students in the financial, you know, aid market, which, you know, as many of us know, is a, a tough thing to navigate. Right. Um, it's a it's a her. It's, it's a young woman, 30 year old woman, actually, who started this company. And um, it was I remember it got some very good press. Uh, and then shockingly, um, J.P. Morgan decided to buy it and then made the calls to find out how few people actually signed up. So it, it got a lot of press. It turned out it didn't get a lot of attention. Um, I, it didn't deserve a lot of attention. It didn't have a successful um, business run, right? I mean, it didn't have that many customers after all, but JP Morgan didn't find out until after they bought her company. And you know, now lawsuits are flying and it's very, very awkward. But again, as we've talked about with some of these fraud things or even these crypto things, I mean, you have to put the work in and, and due diligence. And I, I'm really surprised that JP Morgan didn't because- I mean, for one thing, it's J.P. Morgan. Come on. I was going to say, they can need a $175 million loss, but the damage to the reputation of a company that's supposed to be ironclad and guilt-edged and, you know, dot every I and cross every T and and check the addition five five or six times, for them to make something, do something this stupid, kind of makes you wonder about the whole operation. I agree. And I think, you know, you had talked about what, uh, a VC looks for and some of the long-term things that go into this as opposed to the get rich quick almost schemes that a lot of people look at us in Silicon Valley as being part of. And yeah. this just plays into that. I mean, it's an East Coast giant financial institution, uh, you know, and they've got to look at some of these companies and say, what in the world are they doing? And, you know, I mean, uh, you know, obviously FTX was in the Bahamas, but this is happening here with Theranos. I mean, some of these things where they lured the big dollars without 
the research being done and without the due diligence being done. And everybody is, everybody loses regardless of who ultimately is at fault. But it just, it paints the whole industry badly. I think this, these big institutions go, everything's hot out there in tech. We got to get in there. And someone says, well, we better check these guys out. And it's like, if we if we take time doing diligence on these guys, somebody else is going to snap them up. We got to move quickly. And you know they're going to be successful because everybody's successful in technology right now. I mean, you could see that, that conversation going on at a boardroom, you know, in downtown Manhattan at J.P. Morgan. Right, right. I mean, it's just embarrassing. And again, it paints everybody in a bad light. This is, it, it, you know, we all laugh at it, but really, um, right. It's they can afford the financial hit, but what about the next startup? And and yeah. specifically the next startup run by a woman. Part of the problem with Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes is there was a chilling effect on female-led startups and female VCs very unfairly. And you hope that doesn't happen again here. This person, she's, I think, all of 30 and again, uh, how you do this? Sam just... Bankman Freed's girlfriend too. I mean, we've had three women basically in the last year. I mean, this can't be a trend, but it, I mean, it's probably a coincidence. But boy, you find yourself thinking: Will any woman entrepreneur ever be able to raise money again? At this point, I mean, this is a bad run. I agree. This is a time when women were finally moving into the entrepreneurial ranks in the leadership. Anyway, so last week's scammer, uh, FTX founder and former CEO, Sam Bankman Freed, has just launched his own Substack <laughs> uh, newsletter today. I mean, if a guy, if that guy would just shut up, he might have a chance, but he seems to have logorrhea. I mean, he has to keep talking about this. And uh, he's got to be digging a deeper hole. The, his first post was entitled... FTX postmortem, a premortem overview. He maintains his innocence uh, surrounding the collapse and bankruptcy of FTX. And he wrote, I didn't steal funds and I certainly didn't stash billions away. Nearly all of my assets were and still are utilizable to backstop FTX customers. Uh, I have, for instance, offered to contribute nearly all of my personal shares in Robinhood to customers or 100%. If the Chapter 11 team would honor my DNO legal, legal expense identification, so he's is this a just a PR effort? See, I'm actually not a bad guy. I'll make it up to some of these people, uh, but he's making a public statement before he goes to trial. Uh, I mean, I can see the prosecution just licking their lips on this thing, and the defense going, "Well, I'm sure the defense counsel are out drinking right now." After reading that one, what well, is he right. doing? I, I don't know, but look, you know, he he can't go on TV anymore because, you know, he's he's locked down and, you know, home arrest or whatever they call it when you're trapped in your parents' house. Um, but uh, he's found a way to to post, and his I'm guessing his defense attorneys are just as happy as they were when he was talking to George Stephanopoulos. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is the guy that can't stop, like you say, digging a hole and. Um, uh, it, it just doesn't look good, and he has not made it look any better by speaking out, or in this in this case, posting. Um, and his defense attorneys have got to just said, "Look, Sam, stop. Let us do our job to try to limit the inevitable sentence that you're facing here." Um, but I, I just can't think that any of this, whether on Substack or on Good Morning America, is helping him at all. Now, if you were his defense counsel, wouldn't one of the reasons you took this on was because the man was really rich and he could pay you a lot of money for your services, no matter how much misery and frustration he put you through? But if he's basically broke, what keeps the defense counsel there? I mean, are we going to start seeing a mutiny pretty soon or at least people resigning and moving on, getting away from this blast zone? Um, it's a good question and, and one that was asked on, on Theranos, uh, during the Theranos case, because all that money was lost too. But I think in, in his case, just like her case, there's family money, there's enough to retain a law firm, at least for now. Um, yeah. and other than that, I don't know where the money would come from, but remember 
the people finding money when it comes to this bankruptcy case say they found a decent chunk of money from what FTX said was lost. So maybe that's where some of the money comes maybe from. It turns goes, out goes to the top of the list of creditors. Maybe they get paid first. Maybe so. Um, so there's there's perhaps some of the FTX money that they're finding, um, but also again, you know, uh the, the family money perhaps that that is still there. As as an aside, I, I'm always interested in how the world sees the valley. So, and you and you have a hugely popular Twitter account and Facebook where you're getting you sometimes get millions of people around the world. I just got interviewed yesterday by a young woman from Paris. She writes for one of the leading uh, general interest uh, magazines there. And she was asking a question I keep getting, and I'm sure you're getting. Uh, we saw a cover of Atlantic Monthly recently. Is Silicon Valley dying? Is Silicon Valley dead? Now, we have a different perception from the inside, but I'm sensing that the rest of the world still kind of wondering about that. What do you think? I mean, how do you answer them? I, I mean, I, I, you know, we're in the business of of headlines, right? And and you know, we started this show talking about weather, you know, and we in a pretty quick way went from California is going to be in a drought forever to California is going to be underwater forever, yeah. and I think somewhere much much more in between lies the truth of these things. Silicon Valley is struggling um, because we've lost a lot of value. How did that value? go much higher because during the pandemic, the headlines were the world cannot live without Silicon Valley. Um, now you're seeing headlines, Silicon Valley is dead. Again, I would make the pitch that somewhere deeply in the middle of that is, is the truth. Um, you know, the tech economy runs our show. It doesn't run the nation. And so it's easy to say, hey, I've got a job in finance or in hospitality or in healthcare, very, very crucial industries. And to point a finger and say, Salesforce just lost half its money or, you know, Tesla just lost 75% of its value. Um, and so I have a feeling that these headlines will always continue, but I also am pretty confident that, um, you know, Silicon Valley is going to be around for a while and these companies are going to be around for a while. Yeah. Uh, as long as we're talking about Tesla, the obligatory weekly mention of Elon Musk, <laughs> because apparently anybody covering technology has to mention Elon Musk at least once a week. Uh, the uh, Guardian just reported that Elon Musk has broken the world record for the largest loss of personal fortune in history. Uh, he lost $182 billion since November uh, 2021, mostly due to the drop in uh, Tesla share stock uh, price. Okay, that's a ton of money. I mean, it's not probably not a record you want to hold for very long. But it is telling that, um, you know, how quickly nowadays in this tech world, you can go from being the richest man in the world to suffering the biggest loss in history. Well, and that's what it is. I mean, his fortune was much bigger. And that's why when Tesla tanked, um, it went down so much. And that's, I mean, again, Tesla lost a huge, huge chunk of its value. And that's yeah. how he measures his paper value. So, um, you know, it's... Uh, the reasons are being bandied about. I mean, Tesla's still selling a lot of cars. Clearly, their leader is distracted with, you know, Twitter, not to mention drilling holes below Las Vegas. I mean, these are all things that make Elon Musk what he is, for better or for worse. Um, I would say, you know, if you're NASA, you're happy. If you're an EV owner, you're probably happy. If you're a Tesla shareholder, you're unhappy that he's doing all these things. And so you can yeah. you can be some of those things and not all of those things, right? And and that's where you need to start thinking uh, of Elon Musk. Like, do you want to invest in his companies? Okay, but just know that he's going to, you know, be occupied elsewhere for at least part of the time. And that's just how it goes be, with him. Going to be distracted. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I just have a feeling we're going to be talking about Elon for the rest of the year. So I'll get off that. Finally, uh, now there's a, these there's these surveys like two or three times a year. But uh, a Bay Area city got ranked as the number one happiest city in America. And as it so happens, I live there. 
Sunnyvale. I grew up in Sunnyvale. I went to high school in Sunnyvale. Um, happiest city in America? Okay. I mean, I think I think uh, Fremont got it, or Milpitas got it earlier in the year, but interesting to know. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, do you buy the, do you buy Sunnyvale's being the happiest city? I mean, it's a pretty happy city. I mean, there's not a lot of crime. <laughs> we had a couple break-ins and, and stolen uh, catalytic converters from cars a year or two ago. Uh, have some people living next to a vacant lot across the street for a while in their campers during the boom. Uh, seemed like a pretty nice city. I, but, you know, it's kind of dispiriting when you think, Okay, yeah, it's kind of nice. I'm hunkered in my house hiding from falling trees. I'm thinking, yeah, it's kind of a nice city. But to realize this is the nicest city. This is the ceiling. I've reached the apogee of, of communal happiness in my little in my town. It's kind of it's kind of saddening. You, you kind of hope there's some other shining city on a hill out there that's actually paradise. I mean, you said you've spent pretty much your whole life there and you're happy. So I guess there you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'm that. just laughing through the tears. You know, <laughs> you never know. No, City, Cityville is a well-run city. And but it's I think it benefits from obviously from Silicon Valley. I mean, the part of this was based on wages. Part of this was based on other economic factors that every city. I think there were three cities on the top 10. Uh but, you know, S S Sunnyvale is not as happy as it was a few years ago, you know, and the, when, when the town was orchards and small little neighborhoods and all of that, and we were all living in Eichler. So, I mean, that was that was a pretty nice time, too. Uh, so I sensed that. Oh, but the one good factor was marriage. The rate of enduring marriages in Sunnyvale turned out to be a, a crucial factor and that. You know, I, I certainly added to that uh, that number, but it's interesting to think and, and to close on that, that we, we now live, well, you live five miles from the happiest city in America. <laughs> so um, I think that we can, we can, that'll cheer us up while we sit through the next buffeting of, uh, of windstorms and you're out there on the next sliding hill in the rain. I'll think about how happy you are in Sunnyvale. Yeah, please do i can use all the good thoughts i can get there okay that's it for now folks you can find us on the silicon valley business journal homepage as well as on spotify anchor google Podcasts, apple Podcasts, linkedin and youtube uh have a great weekend and if you're in the valley stay dry see you later bye-bye